thanks for checking out another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. You're tuning in to the best resource to grow your business in an actionable, meaningful way. We've been talking a lot about sales on the podcast. It's a huge pain point for business owners out there. We got Todd Capone on the podcast. He is the owner of Sales Melon, and he's also the author of the book, The Transparency Sale. Now, Todd, I ended up seeing some of his content on LinkedIn. Uh, I got to tell you, I fell in love immediately. This guy knows sales. This guy understands sales. In fact, you probably need to just pause this podcast and go consume as much Todd Capone content as you can, uh, because I love this guy. This guy is crushing it from the sales perspective. And if you feel like you're trying to learn more about sales, but you want to get away from the ickiness of sales, you're going to love what he talks about. I loved our conversation today. Stay tuned. We're going to dive in. Before we do, though, we have a word from one of the amazing businesses who sponsor the podcast and they keep the podcast going. Don't forget, if you want to know more about podcast advertising, you can always reach out at Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com or you can support the show at our Patreon, patreon.com slash goodadvice. Enjoy this episode. We'll be right back soon. There's one single piece of advice that I give to business owners who are ready to scale their business drastically, and that's knowing exactly what you need to hand off so that you can continue focusing on what you're an expert in. It amazes me when I talk to business owners who are doing their own bookkeeping and tax prep, and worse, that they're going through all this paperwork at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, even midnight, slaving away trying to make sense of all of the numbers for their business. Business owners who are making it happen have already figured out that you can't do it all yourself. That's why I recommend Steve Lay with Equity Business Solutions. Not only is he an expert in bookkeeping and tax prep, but what I love about Steve is that he'll sit down with you and help you make sense of the value of your business beyond just reading a spreadsheet. You'll be able to make better decisions and more importantly, you're going to save yourself the crucial time you would have spent going through QuickBooks or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is that keeps us up late at night. So save yourself some time and some money by giving Steve Lay a call at Equity Business Solutions and he'll show you the value beyond your numbers. Go to EquityBusinessSolutionsLLC.com to find out more. Todd, it's so great to have you on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. Where where are you, by the way? Where where are you? Where's the home base of, of uh, Talk Pony World? I am just outside of Chicago in sunny Palatine, Illinois. It's uh, it's beautiful this time of year, which is a total lie. But uh, <laughs> we we actually have a. I'm wearing short sleeves. It's like unseasonably warm right now. So my brother lived in Chicago for a while, and he just talked about like. I guess from the winter months, he just said like no one talked to anyone. They were just trying to get from like point A to point B. Um, yep, exactly, exactly. So, and then here's here's another question because you know we get people on the podcast that are from all over. So I'm always a little curious. Um, I know there's like I'd say I'm total tourist, so I don't know if like drama is the right word, but I know there's a couple of different like deep dish options and people. They kind of not argue, but when I was heading up there recently, someone was like, "Oh, well, you got to go to this one place, um, yeah. Lumin- Luminati's." Is that yep. it or Luminati's? Yep. Yeah, that's right. And then there was another one. Um, I don't remember what there's, it was there's called. There's uh, Giordano's. That's there's, it, actually. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of them. Um, it, you know, the, here's the thing. I mean, they talk about Chicago deep dish pizza. I would say that Chicago's pizza that it's really famous for is a thin crust and it's kind of cut in the squares. Yeah. Like that that's my jam and Lou Malnati's makes the best one of those too. But the deep dish is basically like it's like a um soup pot pie, right? You guys, <laughs> like you know it, like a chicken pot pie but it's pizza. It's just like cheese and then they pour a whole tank of sauce on it. <laughs> well, a friend of mine it's good though. I love it. Well, a friend of mine's from Philly and we were talking about the Philly cheesesteak and he was like, he's like, bro, please don't come up here and order a Philly cheesesteak. It's kind of a tourist thing. Like <laughs> yeah, we like yep. them, but we don't like seek them out. And so right. is, is that the case with the deep dish pizza or? Oh no, I love it. I, okay. I love all Chicago <laughs> Breakfast, pizza. lunch, and, and dinner. I, yeah. <laughs> like last time I was in Philly, I went to Pat's Steaks and got a cheesesteak there. They are mm-hmm. pretty fantastic. Like yeah, yeah don't, okay. we don't, we shouldn't downplay that because it's, <laughs> it's unique and it's great. So yeah. Well, well, Todd, um, man, I'm so excited to have you on today and and thank you for agreeing to come on the podcast. So for our listeners, um, Todd popped up on my LinkedIn uh, feed. Uh, Todd has an incredible LinkedIn following and um, Todd, you, you were, it's interesting. You were talking about 
this wild concept about being upfront and honest with the people that you're selling to. And it just, it just invigorated me. I was, I was watching and I was like, holy cow, this guy knows what he's talking about. I got to get him on the show. And for our listeners, we got a lot of listeners who they're looking for that angle in the sales game. Cause it's, it's a hard game out there. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what's, what's kind of your MO, you know, what are you doing with sales melon? I, I'd love to introduce the audience to, you know, your, your take on the sales game. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you the story. Um, so my last role, I was the chief revenue officer of a tech company here in Chicago called power reviews. And you could probably guess from the name we were in the review space and you've yeah. probably interacted with it before, right? If you bought a pair of Crocs, Look at the product, scroll down, there's the reviews. That was us doing the collect and display for them and a thousand other retailers and brands. Here's what happened. Um, We did a research study. We partnered with Northwestern University here just to look at, again, these two things should have nothing to do with each other, but I'm a nerd. You're going to hear that loud (laughs) and clear here in a second. But we were just looking at consumer behavior when a website's acting as a salesperson, right? On a retail website, like what do people do? Three data points came out of it, two of which changed my life. Like a lunatic, I quit my job and wrote a book. All right. So (laughs) the the three data points, the first one that didn't change my life, which should be no surprise to anybody, is that we all read reviews today, right? Like we're buying Mm. something we haven't bought before. That's a medium to high consideration. We're going to read the reviews first. But the two that changed my life, number one, was that 85% of us go to the negative reviews first. We skip the five-star reviews and we read the fours, threes, twos, and ones. And then that last data point was that a product on a five-star scale that has an average review score between a four, two, and a four, five, that's optimal for purchase conversion. Meaning a product that's got negative reviews right under it will sell at a higher conversion rate than a product that has nothing Mm. but positive, perfect five-star reviews. And I'm looking at that going, all right, why do we go to the negative first? Why do we need the negative to convert? And does that apply to human to human and B2B selling too? And I started digging into the behavioral science and found immediately that, yeah, the answer is yes. Like we as human beings, we know at a subconscious level that perfection doesn't exist. And until Mm. we can get to the negative, we can't even process the positive. Mm. And so we started trying it, meaning you know, we would go into selling situations and really take an empathetic lens from the customer's perspective and go, hey, listen, before we get too deep into this, there's a couple of things that we do great, right? Obviously, we've got customers, but there's a couple of things that we're not the best at. Can can we start there? Because if those are going to be important, we might not be the right partner for you. Like starting there or starting with, hey, our price is kind of at the higher end. Here's the expectation around what your investment's going to be. If that's way off. Like, let's talk about that first. It's leading with kind of the elephant in the room, the negative, what we give up to be great at our core. And like magic happened. Win rates went up, mm. cycle lengths uh, sped up. We qualified in better. We lost the deals we were going to lose anyway, but faster. We made it harder on our competitors. And I was like, this is incredible. But it really speaks to this idea that if we're presenting our solutions as perfect, we're not making it easier on buyers. We're making it harder. And for all the entrepreneurs and you know business owners out there, guys, if you're if you're doing that, like don't be afraid. You don't need a plaid coat and gold chains to be successful in selling. <laughs> you're you're there to be a partner mm-hmm. of your customers and to help them predict. You're not there to convince them. I love that word you said predict. Um, man, you had another post. This is just going to be me fanboying on your content. <laughs> this is, and I joked about this before. Like once you engage with someone for the first time, it's like LinkedIn is like, here's everything they've ever written. You know, <laughs> but you posted something recently that talked about, um, you know, buyers when when they're navigating their purchasing decision, they're thinking about risk, and so. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, where my mind goes to is like, how do you offer trust? But you you took it a step farther with the word I really resonated with, what, which was how do you offer predictability yeah. to someone? Uh, and I think for a lot of us as business owners, it's, it's hard to, especially for, and I'm going to speak on behalf of the people listening who have integrity and like genuinely want to do right by their customers. For me, sometimes I have found myself in this bit of a gray area where someone's like, okay, tell me where this is going to go. And I know that the end point is just as reliant on what they're doing, not just what I'm doing. 
Uh, and so it's like, I know we're going to go there, but I don't want to guarantee it because you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I want to be open and honest, but I also don't want to mislead someone if, you know, we get into it and it's like, dude, you disappeared for like two months. Like, you know, of course this didn't go anywhere. <laughs> what, right. What's your advice there? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of, there's, there's a lot there, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, there's two things that I want everybody to kind of consider. Um, number one is this idea that, you know, so many of the most successful B2C brands in the world are so great at this, uh, like Ikea, for example, right? Like you go to an Ikea and you walk in, they hand you a map. Like, you know, you're in for hell on earth, right? Like this is going to suck. And <laughs> well, then you have the food, the food right nearby. Well, yeah. Like, you so you break. go up, yeah. you, you try to find what you're looking for. You can't find it. Uh, you finally find it. There, there's nobody there to help you. You got to write yeah. down the code. Or you're take lost a with your phone. You're lost in the store, you know, <laughs> right? Because you're going to have to go down to the warehouse and do the like, pull the boxes on the cart. You're going to have to wheel it, jam it into your car, <laughs> swearing at whoever you're with yeah, as you yeah. do it. You get home, you got to assemble it. You know, IKEA is the number one furniture retailer in the world for 14 straight years, and they do it by saying, "Hey, listen, these are the things that you're mm. going to have to do on the journey, right? Uh, you're going to have to find it, pick it, pack it, shove it, assemble it." But mm. we do that so that we can give you modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay much for. And like you said, the, the meatballs upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I think it's such an opportunity for B2B too, to just be like, hey, listen, like brand what you do, but brand what you don't do too. Mm. And you end up, instead of having that funnel, like, hey, let's, everybody that's got anything other than lint in their wallet, let's talk to them. Instead, shrink that. And the people that come in are pre-qualified. And they know what they're going to get. They know the expectations and they're with you. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, there's good and there's bad with all that we sell, all that we do. If you set those proper expectations, there's trust built and they're willing to take the journey with you. And I, I think that's that's the difference that I don't see too many B2B brands doing that I think is such an opportunity, especially if you're in sales. Mm -hmm. How did you learn in your sales career to let go to to really to niche down who you're selling to because I, I there's there's people I've talked to before who I was just at an event this last week actually where uh, somebody was selling and he said hey you know my ideal customer is anybody you know and I thought well that's that's a lot of people yeah <laughs> I mean not just me it's just a lot of people and I've I, I think in this conversation it's and maybe it's a conversation of scare, scarcity I, I don't know what it is but. I think exactly what you're talking about, what the visceral sometimes reaction is, is like, oh, well, like, I really need all the business I can get. I don't want to say no. Like, how do you coach people through that? Oh, man. So there's a couple of things. Um, so, you know, I wrote that first book, The Transparency Sale. The second book is called The Transparent Sales Leader. And it's basically, it's a framework for maximizing revenue capacity, all optimized by science on a bed of transparency. So it's kind of not the, the right title of the book. But one of the stories I tell about it in there is just that, you know, our responsibility to sell something is to transfer confidence to the customer, right? And I'm just a believer that if you wake up every day and you're calling on 20 different individuals in 20 different industries with 20 different challenges, there's the only expertise you can develop is about yourself and your own products. You can't become an expert in their world, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not an expert in their world, you can't help but not be as confident as you probably should be. One of the, the things that I talk about in that book is like when I was um, running sales for a startup 15 years ago, we could sell to anybody who manufactures anything. Mm -hmm. But we had made this uh, kind of this bet because we had in aerospace and defense, we had seen a real excitement about what we were doing that we just said, hey, we can call on everybody, sure. But for let's just do a what I call an extreme firmographic sprint. We're going to bring in experts in aerospace and defense to teach us everything there is to know about that. We're going to talk to our customers. We're going to pull up the case studies for aerospace and defense. We're going to learn what they read, how they're measured, where they go to get smarter about their business. And the next thing you know, my reps who each had 500 accounts on their account list, every morning they were waking up calling their aerospace and defense customers. And suddenly, this is during the Great Recession of 2008-2009, we grew 400% year over year. And it mm. started by getting Boeing, Gulfstream, Cessna. Like All of a sudden, we saw this, this rolling ball and we're like, wait a second. Being able to like take that ICP, ideal customer profile, 
and take it down a level and go, let's do focus sprints and just become experts in their business, not ours. And you can't help but ooze confidence and gain momentum doing that way. And I've I've been a huge believer of that ever since. You know, you've talked a lot about um, like leaning. I mean, you just mentioned it, like leaning into their industry, but also you've you've you clearly are, you're a data junkie. Is the impression I get, or maybe data is not the right, but like history and statistics. And uh, you had shared something again, me goozing over your content uh, about like a, a, a headline from like 1906 or something um, about how like people people buying know more than they've ever known before. Which it's always yeah. funny, by the way, like. These things oh, that yeah. you feel like is so relevant to right now. And then you see like, oh, wait, this was already being said, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, uh, tell me, how do you, how do you marry like your interest in like the science of sales with like the, uh, you know, there's kind of a nuance to it too. Right. And I feel like, I feel like there's a blend of those things that make you a great salesperson. Um, I, I'd be curious kind of how you navigate both of those. Well, I mean, first of all, the science community has put their finger on understanding how we as human beings engage, prioritize, and decide, right? Like that's, and it, it's not rocket science. It's very like, again, <laughs> we need the negative, the process, the positive. We yeah. don't buy when we're convinced. We buy when we can predict, right? Like just simple things like that, you know, that just at its fundamental layer, if we understand it and then we can use it for good, not evil, it should be able to help anybody who has to influence anyone to do anything to be better at it. And I just, I don't see enough of that. So that's, that's number one. Number two, though, to your point is it, history just continues to repeat itself. Um, I, part of my problem with LinkedIn is I will read through it and almost every like, wow, that's a great post that I see. I'm like, I can quote somebody that said that same thing 120 oh, yeah. years ago, right? Like, oh, yeah. And like the one that you're talking about, which I think everybody might find funny, is um, buyers know more nowadays, right? Like buyers know more nowadays. You see that all over the place. Like they've, they've got access to more information and it's a threat to the sales profession. <laughs> that buyers know more nowadays is a direct quote from Thomas Herbert Russell's 1912 book, Salesmanship, right? Yeah, okay. And, <laughs> you know, like, and today you, you keep seeing all these things about like, hey, the rise of e-commerce, the rise of AI, it's going to be a threat to the sales profession. This down here, for anybody who's able to watch this, like this is the 1908 Sears Roebuck catalog. 1908, you could literally buy anything in here. You could buy modular homes. You could, there's like a department of human hair. In, like, I mean, it's, but like literally <laughs> everything you can buy here. This is Amazon 115 years ago, yeah. right? That there's there's nothing different. The, the quote that I will end this little part with you on is from Arthur Sheldon in 1911. And this, so for any of you that are thinking about what your role is in the sales world, Arthur Sheldon defined sales as this. True salesmanship is the science of service. Grasp that thought firmly and never let go. You are providing a service to your buyers, right? You're not the catalog. Yeah, you're not going to compete with the catalog, the e-commerce, the AI, all that. What you are going to be able to do, though, is if you can help your customers predict from an empathetic lens, and that comes with sharing the negatives and the positives, that comes with that firmographic focus so that you can actually be an advocate for them, you're providing a service to them, and that will never go out of style. That'll never go away. Whatever yeah. challenge is right around the corner, <laughs> if you grasp the thought of sales as a service forever, you will always be a value to your customers. Todd, you you obviously have like a um, you mentioned just service, but obviously, like I, I would say, honesty and integrity seem like key pillars of what you're doing. And these aren't these aren't always the first qualities people think of when they think of sales. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, what's like? What's your? Are you just like a good dude? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like how, how did this come about? Like, because I think that's what's so like it, what attracts people to you, and, and for me included, was I feel like sometimes I'm in like this tug of war. Like I'm talking on the podcast, I'm trying to give advice to people and I'm, it's like this tug of war between what they're seeing on social media, which is, and it's not always so overtly slimy, but it, it is sometimes not in the best interest of the buyer. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a tug of war between like, Hey, be, you know, serve them, do what's, do what's best for your customer. And it's like this back and forth. Um, so it's, it's exciting to see your content, but I'm also just curious, like, you know, <laughs> you, you could probably yeah. sell anything at this point. Like. Like, why do you do it the way you do it? 
Well, I'll tell you, I, I was the CRO, right? Had this revelation, saw this magic. I was like, I want to get these ideas out there. I quit my job. My CEO, I remember when I resigned, he was like, Todd, I don't know whether to hug you or to hit you with a bat, right? Like he literally <laughs> said that. Um, I left two weeks later. Uh, the the guy that's on the cover, the cover quote is from the, he was the former COO of Salesforce. He finds out that I left. He calls me and he's like, Todd, I got a, a job for you, man. There's a CRO role. You'd be perfect for it. I'm like, Andy, stop, stop. Dude, I'm, I quit my job to write a book. Like, I'm, I got to get these ideas out there. And he's like, write a book. <laughs> you know what, Todd, do this job for two years. You'll get another exit. Think of the experiences you'll have. It'll, the book will be so much better. And I'm like, Andy, it's not a memoir. The book needs to be written right now. Mm. And so to your question is like, why? Even 20 years ago, you could lie and get away with it. You know, I worked at SAP in the late 90s where the answer to every customer question was yes. Like, can you do this? Yes. Like it was, it, it, it didn't matter, right? It, you have a complaint. What are you going to do? Like call an 800 number, write a letter? Like who cares? I believe that transparency sells better than perfection, right? And the, the data and behavioral science all supports it. But the thing about now is that we have to do it because the proliferation of reviews and feedback and everything we do by an experience, B2B, B2C doesn't matter. It's so easy for your customers to get to the truth. Hmm. I'm a believer that we have to play the long game because it helps you win the long game. But in this proliferation of information availability, Playing the long game helps you win the short game too, because the mm -hmm. lie, you know, reveals itself very, very quickly. And then, my favorite sales quote of all time. All right, 1921, a guy named Arthur Dunn in his book Scientific Selling and Advertising. His quote is simply this. He has a whole page dedicated to it in his book. Like there's just one page, one line. If the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. It's like magic, right? If the truth won't, and I've like, I read that and I was like, <laughs> I cried. I, I just, it was beautiful, but it's so true. They believed it back then. I believe it now, but you have to do it now. And that's why I think we all need to go embrace it. What well, I mean, when you see, I mean, because I see some content on LinkedIn or on all the socials where I'm just like, uh, okay, sure. Um, I mean, people are trying a variety of different ways to sell people. Um, what What's your typical reaction? Like, do you ever feel, um, uh, not to call people out, but like, do you just scroll past? Do you ever just think like, mm, I don't know. I mean, do you get frustrated? Do you laugh? Like what? Cause there's a lot of sales junk on there. Um, <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, you know what? I always try to play like, like take the high road. Right. And my role in what I share and, you know, I, my life now is I speak and teach, right? So I'm doing keynotes. I think I've got nine kickoffs already scheduled for beginning of 2024 that I'm doing. I'm just trying to get that word out and have people experience it. And when they have experience with it and then they do it, that's where this proliferates out from. If, if people are doing it the wrong way, again, like the truth always reveals itself. Um, I think honesty will always prevail. And so when I see something that I totally dif uh, disagree with, I might make a comment. I might send a, a DM to them and go, hey, you might want to think about it this way. For, but for the most part, I just don't have the time, dude. <laughs> like, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> well, and, you know, we're all getting those DMs ourselves oh, yeah. of, you know, the endless pitches. And I like to joke about some of those on the podcast. And um, but but all that to say something else, just as we're kind of wrapping up today, something else that you've said a couple of times you know, I think, I think for the aspiring entrepreneur or the small business owner, you know, our time is so valuable. Yes. And you said something earlier in our, in our show that I, I really loved. And it was something about, um, you know, the person when you're upfront and honest about what you're not great at the person who was, and I'm going to change your words just a little bit, but the person who was never going to be your customer anyway, like you finally get that out of the way from the get go. Yes. And I think, I think this is a pain point that many of us, and here's what's kind of obnoxious about this is people on, on social media are like, you know, don't chase customers, but we've all been in that situation where you have this really lucrative customer, not in a negative way, but you know, they're going to cover your bottom line for the next six months. And so you can't help but chase a little bit. And it's this back and forth. And you're like, ah, oh, where's this going to go? So our time as business owners is everything. Um, and I don't necessarily have a question, just that I, I really love that perspective of yours. Just kind of well, get I, I have a quick story for you. 
Yeah. So I, I do a little bit of advisory work. I've got one client that was a, it's a startup. Uh, they sell to retailers. And uh, we had worked together on that ICP and then the focus component, right? The ICP is call on retailers. The focus, though, is let's get down to a level where we are truly aligned to the sizes, the environments, what they're selling, right? And so we got, we defined that firmly, like, you know, 50 million to 300 million in revenue or like, you know, whatever that band mm. was. Sure enough, they get an inbound from Nordstrom, right? Multi-billion dollar retailer. I get the call from the CEO. He's like, dude, incredible <laughs> news. They were looking for a solution like ours. They Googled it and they found us and they called. And uh, man, I, this is going to change everything. And I was like, um, you know, we talked about why you don't want to go too small or too big. Remember that conversation? He's like, screw you, Todd. It's Nordstrom. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you be know? Careful. And and sure enough, I, I, the next thing that I said, though, was, do they know you're basically three dudes in a closet? Like, do they know that? Mm. And he's like, oh, no, I'm not going to tell them that. Like, you, if you're going to go after them, you better tell them. Because yeah. you think Nordstrom's going to trust something to their checkout page as they're entering the holiday season and not check and figure out what kind of an organization you are, do you think they're going to trust three dudes in a closet? You got to lead with that dude. Like you got to go and have that conversation and say, Hey, before we get too deep into this, yeah, we're just getting started. We're not working with anybody the size of you yet. Mm -hmm. If that's going to be a problem, can we address that now versus after you burn three months on it and we burn three months of cash runway, right? Mm -hmm. Like you got to get out ahead of it. And so, Finally, he bought into that, shared it with them, and they're like, "Ooh, yeah, that that's a good point. We were going to check. Um, let, let's address that. Like, let's just make sure because if we're just talking about code on a web page, we're probably going to be all right. Um, if it's going to be a bigger investment than that, then we're going to break you. Mm -hmm. We should investigate that. And it just took the elephant that's hiding in the room mm -hmm. and and elevated it before it goes around crushing everything in it. Right, <laughs> and and so." If for all the, the startups and the in, like, the entrepreneurs and the business owners out there, just make sure if you're working with those bigger organizations that they know what they're getting, right? Mm -hmm. Embrace that and lead with it because you don't want that to hit you three months from now when you just burn three months of runway and mm -hmm. three months of opportunity to cost to go after opportunities that are a better fit for you. I love it. Todd, it has been amazing having you on the show today. For people listening, we mentioned the transparency sale. What's, what's like the best next step somebody and, and i'm just going to say for everyone listening like you gotta you gotta follow todd on linkedin but for someone who wants to engage with you directly more of your content what have you what's the next best step for them to do that yeah i mean i think you know the, the transparency sale and then for business owners and entrepreneurs i mean i didn't really write it for that get that book it's the, the framework that i've created for building and maximizing your revenue capacity just read the intro in chapter one and I think it'll change your lens on what's required to maximize the revenue capacity of your organization. So do those. But I always point people to either LinkedIn or just toddcaponi.com. I've got, there's a blog on there. There's videos. There's my sales history podcast if anybody's a nerd and wants to go check that out. <laughs> but uh, toddcaponi.com is a really simple place to start. Okay. Todd, it's been amazing having you on the show today. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. This has been fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, for our listeners, I'm going to put the link to his website, his book, and also his podcast down in the episode description below. Uh, and if you are checking out the podcast for the first time and you enjoyed this episode, what the heck are you waiting on? Click the subscribe or follow button so you can keep getting good advice wherever you are. And don't forget, if you want to advertise your business on the podcast, you can reach out at Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. We appreciate those of you who have supported the podcast long term. And of course, those of you on our Patreon also supporting the podcast. All that to say, that's today's good advice. We'll catch you later. See ya.